and welcome to the next webinar of our series of Open RiskNet. Um, I'm happy to see so many of you here and, and also some new names, unfortunately not faces, but names. Um, it's really a pleasure to welcome Holly today and, uh, and it's, it's great that she will give an introduction to AOPDB. Uh, but before we start, I would like to just use five minutes to, to introduce Open RiskNet again to all these people who um, didn't have the chance to yet see what we are doing in, in the project. Um, I also want to, to advertise again that there are multiple of these um, webinars already available as, as um, recordings and we will continue to um, have these um, have these um, webinars? Actually, this is the wrong presentation. Sorry about that. Um, this is the today's presentation from my side, um, which gives you a little bit or gives the correct um, title or the correct title. I just have to get that. Presenter mode, sorry about that. Uh, but today we have uh, the uh, uh, AOPDB. Uh, this is a continuation of last, or two weeks ago, I think, no, two weeks ago, yeah, uh, where Egon presented um, the open risk net implementation of the AOP wiki. Um, Marvin and, and Egon, and, and now today we have uh, Holly here. The webinar last year, uh, last, two weeks ago webinar will also be available as recording or I think it is already on our website. Um, just to, as I said, very quickly introduction to Open RiskNet. Uh, we are a European um, funded um, infrastructure uh, consortium which um, is trying to develop a um, a platform which helps risk assessors and others to to do in silico or to access data and, and um, run modeling analysis and, and many other things in a harmonized and interoperable uh, way. Um, the starting idea why we, why we created that was mainly that Personally, we were relatively frustrated that there are so many tools, but they are relatively complicated to use because they all have to be installed separately. They have different input formats, output formats, and therefore everything. Uh, the user has to do a lot of, of transferring of data from one side to the other. And, and this was exactly the idea that we can facilitate that. Um, we do that by this case study driven development really look at, at uh, specific cases, um, what normally a risk assessors, uh, computational toxicologists are doing as tasks um, in chemical and nanomaterial risk assessment. Um, as I said, we are not developing new tools, but we really want to make these tools easier accessible in this, in this um, integrated approach. Um, having some standards, but relatively loose standards, how these um, tools can work with each other, um, where we can build workflows and get these um, workflows, um, different tools into these workflows and, and do in that way more than each of these tools can do um, on itself. Um, we want to include stakeholders very early. That is why we have these work, uh, webinars. And we also want to include associated partners um, over the implementation challenge, how we call that, that we really bring in um, groups from outside the consortium, uh, provide support, which even includes financial support. And Tolly is one of these challenge winners. Um, and, and therefore, we are so happy to, to also that she can now present her work. Um, as I said, we, we orientated a little bit these case studies around the framework. What, what normally is done is in risk assessment. This is just taken from, from a paper which came out two years ago where this risk assessment framework was, was put into these diff different steps. And according to that, we tried to, to build um, 
case studies which pick individual parts of this and the AOP link um, where, where the AOP wiki and the AOP, uh, AOP database are very essential parts as one of these case studies. Um, if you are more on the uh, technical side, uh, this is just a very quick <laughs> run through all the things we do. Uh, from from REST APIs to containerization, and then put that all into a virtual infrastructure. Um, this is described much better and much more in detail on our web page. And we are really happy to support everyone who is interested in bringing uh, their tools onto this infrastructure by by um, helping you to, to fulfill or to put in these different uh, requirements to then become part of the open risk net family of tools. Um, as I said, we, we are then developing that into workflows where these different tools are taken together to build uh, something more. Um, here I just show the Jupyter notebooks, which we really uh, uh, yeah, are fans of because they are easy to, to develop new things, uh, try something out, and, and this is where we are. Um, at the moment, but this should then become more and more mature and in that way also much more easier for the for the user to, to use the tools um, without even being uh, or the need to, to program or to script, but more in um, user-friendly workflow tools. Um, if you want to try it out, there are many things. Uh, we have the our virtual infrastructure or reference infrastructure where you can uh, play around with the tools which are existing. If you like, you can also create your own virtual environment. Uh, we have these webinars, but also have different different um, places where we go. And therefore, if you want to to um, meet somebody from us in person, then you are really invited to try to catch us at these uh, meetings. If you want, we can, or if you need help. Uh, we are happy to do so, and we would be also be very interested in if you would spend a little bit of time and, and do the requirement survey, which helps us to make this structure even better. That was all. These are our consortium, 11 partners here, are 12, but one is the same because uh, all Jenning moved. Uh, but in principle, we are now 11 partners uh, doing the whole thing, plus now, I think we are eight um, associated partners who won the implementation challenge. As I said, Holly is one of them, plus a couple of other um, associated partners. Therefore, this whole thing is meant to grow, and it grows nicely, which, which I really am happy, and I would like to invite all of you to also become part of this um, and by using it or by providing tools. That was everything. I hope that was not too long, uh, but it still gave you a little bit of an idea of what OpenRiskNet is doing. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer them at the end of the webinar. But now I would hand over to Holly for her presentation. All right. Um, thanks so much for having us. We're um, really excited to be part of the project. So I was hoping to just tell you a little bit about the AOP database um, and how it started and what we're doing with it. Um, and then I have two of my student contractors here that will go into some of their work at the end. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a, a time for a couple of questions. So I included this on my first slide because this is really kind of Oh, how the AOP database um, started. The idea was that um, you know, we kind of started in concert with the AOP Wiki as sort of a back-end um, data storehouse, um, so to speak. And um, some of the places that we were pushing data to or ideas that we were trying to get at were um, shown over here on the right-hand side. Um, but one of the main themes that we um, we're thinking of at the very beginning was that um, if we pull all of this information together with the AOPs and try to understand the biological context that we would be able to get at this computationally predicted AOP net. So that was one aspect of it that 
we're still thinking about. Um, so can you, are my slides moving on with me? Looks okay. Yes, um, okay, okay. Um, so the AOP database, um, just a little bit about it. Um, it's an EPA SQL database at this moment in time. It's internal only and um, we've been using it um, as a hypothesis generation tool basically and so um, the database itself aggregates gene um, AOP gene relationships with chemical disease pathway species information and um, ont ontological relationships um, basically again it's just the idea was we really couldn't get a, a clear understanding of the biology of the AOPs you know whether they were computationally predicted or expert um, contributed um, and so the the idea of, of understanding the greater biological context text of the AOP just um, as a hypothesis generation tool um, on its own was um, necessary and that's that was what motivated the initial creation of the database um, now we really we think that you know as AOPs continue to come in um, the the database is very important in terms of, of trying to just um, link with other information and, and get a clear idea of, of what these AOPs are telling us, how they overlap um, with disease endpoints or pathway information, whatnot. Um, and and I, I had contributed two papers to the group um, today. One of them is Pittman. It's um, um, listed here. So um, this was um, sort of the initial idea I wanted to bring up, Novacet Oki's paper, um, where um, for those of you that aren't super familiar with adverse outcome pathways, I, I don't imagine there's too many in our group here, but um, uh, how we're thinking of, of the adverse outcome pathways is basically um, going from molecular, cellular, tissue, organ, all the way to population information and, and combining um, existing data sets um, so that we can see, you know, how the data are kind of spread. And so we did, this figure is taken from Oki's paper, um, and um, I wanted to bring that up, but um, the original purpose of the database um, was, again, to, to create this sort of computationally predicted AOP net and for putative AOP development um, work that we did with Steve Edwards, and then also um, to try to understand and characterize AOPs for case study. Um, one approach was to look at species applicability and that's described in Pittman et al. And then um, an alternate um, uh, way of thinking about things really is um, to try to get at community um, risk or inter-individual variation, um, genetic variation. And we discussed that a little bit in Mortensen and Chamberlain. And so here is the current schema for the AOP database. We're in the second version. Um, and some of the data sources that are listed here um, and just some general counts. Um, but as you can see, we have um, chemical gene association information. That's from CTD. Um, and we've also been in some discussion with um, Carolyn Mattingly from CTD to try to decide if, um, I know they're spending a lot of time with their computationally predicted AOPs and we're thinking of, in terms of other data sources, maybe pulling in their literature-based computationally predicted AOPs. That might be um, another direction that we could take the AOP database, but um, we're still in discussion with the, those folks. And um, we have, you know, chemical um, drug identifiers, but the, the main theme in the, in the cent central part of the schema here is, um, you know, the whole database is basically linked on on gene um, and protein identifiers. And um, for the most part, that's human. Um, we do have, we've included species orthology information so that we can then link out and say, okay, if this, if this AOP is relevant in another species or, um, or in human, how can we characterize other species for that um, easily? Um, the initial work um, for now that's uh, we're using this AOP wiki XML I think a lot of people are 
a lot of folks are using it, but um, initially this work was done um, manually, and so I wanted to make a note here. Um, Kataya Ives and Maureen Pittman kind of got together and mapped the ontology information um, with ToxCast identifiers, and we include that in the AOP database as well. Um, so they did the heavy lifting, and now um, it's coded in, and of course we have it, can access it through the XML file. Uh, just quickly, some of the case study examples that are in Pittman et al. Um, on how we are have thought and are thinking about using the database. Um, basically, starting out with the key event um, gene targets and basically going through chemical or disease um, orthology type of queries and drilling down. Um, alternatively, um, you know, you can start with the disease of interest and ask for the associated gene list um, and then how that relates to AOPs and get a, a greater understanding of, of the AOPs that relate to that disease, for example. Um, this is, I just wanted to show this um, quickly, some unpublished work um, that Maureen Pittman worked on, um, whereby we were basically using the AOP database to come up with um, a, a workflow whereby we're taking the AOP and trying to understand um, species applicability um, by using um, uh, co-expression um, network construction. So we're basically defining a functional neighborhood um, of genes for any given AOP and then drilling down um, through different species that are relevant and trying to understand in terms of their co-expression patterns and how the modules, the gene modules relate um, for different species. So this is one approach I, I um, still need to write this one up. Um, <clears throat> this slide is um, showing, um, I'm sorry, hold on one second. I have to, I can't see the whole slide here, one sec. Um, so yeah, I wanted to bring up this um, recent paper, this Mortensen et al., whereby um, John Chamberlain, uh, one of my students, um, worked on pulling in, taking, using the AOP database as like basically a way to pull in gene sets. And we looked, we thought about comparing those to different environmental um, gene sets. Um, in this figure on the right-hand side, we're sort of showing, you know, how some overlap between the AOP database genes and um, different gene sets um, or um, TOX21 assay sets in this example. Um, and thinking about going through this gene set selection um, and validating the gene set, then trying to understand what regulatory regions um, are affecting um, the different genes that are identified or proteins that are identified and then stepping out to try to understand what SNPs are related to the functional outcome so that we can then try to understand uh, population variability and um, this idea of a, a multi-genic outcome specific characterization. So this is something that we're still thinking about and my slides are not advancing, that's great. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so this is something that we're still thinking about, we've been thinking about for some time there, sorry. Um, uh, so the idea actually started to look at community risk and genetic acceptability well before AOPs were ever the thing. Um, and so I reference a paper that we did some time ago, um, which is essentially stepping through um, chemical association with pathways at that time. Um, a mechanist was our idea of a mechanistic characterization before AOPs and how we basically um, wanted to understand the functional targets related so that, that then we could apply more of a um, haplotype network idea um, to characterize um, human populations. So, um, uh, Trevor Levy, who will speak to you after me about um, some of his updates to the second version of the database, is is working on um, um, going and pushing through on this project. Uh, 
So updates to the database. Um, we have done some backend code updates just to try to automate the data pools um, and make it easier for us to, to keep um, everything current. Um, we've also been working on um, with the front end data project, um, Philip Langley is shown here with Trevor, who they're going to both speak to you, but um, basically he's been working on different ways that we that people can pull down information from the database um, using our um, user interface, our front end for the database. And so on along that vein, we've been trying to, or thinking about writing a uh, t tutorial. We're kind of, has we haven't started that exactly yet, but we're working on that. Um, and some new information that were included um, in this round of the database was um, human-based tissue network integration. So Trevor will tell you a little bit more about that and um, including population um, SNP information. So this is just um, to show you that it is, at this point it is internal only. We're working with the Office of Science Management and Information Management here at the EPA to try to get um, more than just a data dump of the database available to folks. Um, um, another one of our databases is the Nanobase. Um, but that's that. And so here um, is some a slide showing our previous attempt of the AOP database front end. And Philip Langley has been um, working with this and creating um, the interface for us. I think it's changed a little bit since this picture um, here, but basically we're thinking of it um, just as a basic approach to just letting people enter in their AOP or gene information and being able to grab um, the genes associated with that AOP um, as, alongside with any chemical disease pathway or taxa kind of information that they're um, interested in and pull it out in an Excel sort of format. All right, so I'll switch over and let Trevor tell you a little, give you a little more detail on the specifics of the database and how it's changed. Okay, so what I've been working on is um, updating the, automating the updates for the current data that's in the AOPDB and also adding a few new data sources. And today I'll just kind of be talking about a quick overview of these sources in the database and the tables and a few use examples. So here's, uh, here are the tables that come from the AOP wiki data. Um, so that's AOP's key events and stressors. And these come from the AOP Wiki XML data dump, and they are updated quarterly with the most recent um, data. Um, so these are the gene tables. Uh, we have mapping for um, mapping between entree ID and all the other gene IDs from. Um, so we do that with Unipro, and that's the ID mapping table. NCBI gene gets us all our gene info table, and the string DB is the um, gives us protein protein interactions. Um, so it's important to note, as you might have seen in the schema illustration earlier, that the gene info table is central to the database and basically links all the other uh, tables um, together through gene info gene uh, through entree ID. Um, so it's also important to note that the AOP uh, gene table, um, so most of that comes from the wiki, but the entree ID is actually mapped from um, the object ID from the AOP wiki XML uh, by protein, on, uh, protein ontology to get the entree IDs. And this is a vital link for the AOPDB because it gets all the AOP information integrated with all the other information. So here are our taxonomy sources. Uh, we get species info from NCBI and um, we get homology 
and orthology info from metaphors, homology, and keg orthology. And so since there's multiple sources, we have an orthoscores table um, to cover the redundancy. And so for a use example, suppose you have an AOP in mind um, that has like, for instance, you're looking at a mouse AOP, you can see how the, the AOP links to the taxonomy information um, in this table. Uh, so our chemical sources are um, EPA's ToxCast and uh, the Comparative Toxigenomics Database. So this gets us all sorts of uh, chemical info and the ability to find chemicals of interest and link these to AOPs. And so all our disease um, gene associations come from Dysgenet which includes lots of different disease sources. Um, so because of this redundancy, there's a score field in the disease gene table uh, that kind of gives you a confidence for your disease gene association. And um, that will be higher if you have a lot of sources backing it up, lower if you only have a few. For example, if you're interested in uh, steatosis AOPs, then you can look at those like in the first table here. Um, and then you can further query the AOPDB with the disease gene table and get a short list of diseases that might be of interest to you. And you'll see that there's only one source and so the score is somewhat low for these few. All right, and our pathway sources are um, Keg pathways, reactome, and consens consensus path DB. And this just adds uh, lots of biological pathways for um, AOP DB, AOP context um, through the genes in the pathways. All right, so the tissue networks table is one that I recently added using data from human base. Um, so the connections between the genes are the, the gene interactions are the edges. And so you have um, different networks for each tissue and uh, query genes. And each edge comes with a confidence score, which is like the probability of the gene interaction. Um, so as an example, uh, let's look at the steatosis AOPs again and select one. And so you can get a list of AOP genes associated with that AOP, query a gene, um, and look at that tissue. For instance, in this example, we're looking at entree gene 6720, and um, we're looking at the liver network. And so in the bottom right, this is um, an example of what it might look like on our front end. Um, taking in that tissue network and adding AOP context. So right now I'm working on um, getting SNP frequency table. Um, the, the table on the right is an example of the kind of data that might be in there. So you get your SNPs related to AOP genes and their um, frequency from the Thousand Genomes Project. So what I'm looking to do now is get uh, SNPs of interest. Um, so take all AOP genes and then use GTEx, Portal, SIFT, and Polyfen to kind of filter those down to get useful SNPs that um, are indicators of phenotype changes uh, and get that data into the AOPDB. Okay. <laughs> so Philip Langley will talk to you about um, his work with the front end. I, um, he's been working hard to try to implement this um, and work with the Office of Science and Information Management to make it available on the EPA site, as I mentioned. And um, we'd love your feedback on this one. Thank you, Holly. So as Holly said, I am working on a front end for our database, basically allowing people that aren't the EPA to access it and people that aren't familiar with SQL um, and other technical um, 
sort of things to access it without um, too much trouble. So we're currently constructing the site, the web application in uh, React, Node, Express, and SQL. That's kind of our stack. Um, and basically, right now as it is, people will be able to search for a term. And if that term comes up in any of our tables, they'll be provided with uh, a list of results. And as you'll see it on this site, um, I currently have prepared, they can click that term and then be brought to a page that is dedicated to that term and will show relevant information to that, um, that term. So um, right now we're again trying to get this, this push to the public uh, available to um, basically anyone that wants to use it as a resource. Um, currently we're working on a new version, some, uh, a version that basically has all, all information on one page. So you can kind of click uh, a, a row in the result table as you'll see soon, and it will bring up um, a table on the same page. <clears throat> And we're using React to, to do that. Um, we want to also integrate some of the code Trevor is working on, um, allowing sort of this, this web application to manage the updates of the database and do it automatically. And that'll make um, main, like maintaining the, uh, the database itself much easier. And um, as a, a side avenue for um, working with React, we have an API right now. Currently, it is dedicated to serving the, the sort of the front end aspect, but eventually we want to have like a, uh, a REST API that anyone can access and build a, a client or use for their own purposes. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a just a little video of me navigating around the site. And here we are. So right now I'm typing in um, LXR, which is a term. Um, you brought up uh, one AOP and several genes. As a result, I click on the AOP. And this is an AOP page dedicated to AOP 34. Uh, it's got all of the gene information, stressor information, and disease information and pathway information associated with this AOP. Uh, as you can see, you can switch through the tables. Um, each entry and a table that has another page on the site you can uh, click and it'll bring up that page. Here we have a, um, an entree page for entree gene 7376, which uh, has AOP information and tissue information. And yeah, that's the a very quick uh, <laughs> basic rundown of the website. We also have um, tools at the bottom. Um, right now there's a, there's a full uh, SQL download and also a batch download, so you can upload a list of key terms and pull out uh, all information related to those key terms. So you can upload a list of pathways and you can um, get um, all of the information associated with those pathways and your output of choice. So that's basically the current layout. Um, here's some, some still shots of each of the pages, just some sample pages. Right here we have um, the AOP page I was on with uh, the gene table pulled up. Um, here's, here's the result for searching LXR. Um, here's the uh, stressor table for the AOP LXR uh, 34. And you know, the gene page and also a stressor page. So this will have um, our chemicals or stressors in our tables um, all have pages. And you know, these are the AOP, AOPs associated with uh, that stressor. Okay. So that's basically it. <laughs> okay. So that's our last slide. Um, I hope that um, that was not too fast. Um, and I think we submitted a couple of questions just related mostly to the data and the functionality. Um, if we have time for those. And any so other questions? I think there is a question in the in the in the chat. Ah, if you can see. read it, and then afterwards we can we can put the, the the two questions that you mentioned. Okay, let's see. Uh oh, it's more. And, I see one about the audio. 
Um, let's see. No, no, the one, one uh, it's it's answer. So ah. there's one on the uh, MySQL database question, and then another one from Fred Classic. And from uh, for everybody else, uh, please, uh, if you want to to raise a question and to ask your question, uh, just raise your hands, and then I will I will uh, unmute you. Good grief! What is this? Really to see here. Okay. Are you able to see the questions, Holly? Uh, yeah, we have like a really tiny little window. Hold on one second. Um, okay. Uh, I think you can detach that from the from the uh, dashboard. Oh, you can do uh, the little beside the X. This one. Ah, there thank you. Go. Okay. Um, what is the link to? Yeah, so currently um, the the there is really um, the link to the AOP database is internal only. Um, we're happy to share a dump of the database with anyone who wants to contact me. Um, um, that is that's absolutely fine. Um, but we're working, as I mentioned, with the Office of Science and Information Management and um, to get the database to be publicly available. Um, and that is not um, a super easy process. <laughs> and so we're we're still trying to to make that happen and, and hoping that it won't be um, too many months before that occurs. Um, that was one motivation as well for interacting um, with the open risk group, um, hoping that we could get data to people from the database um, more effectively. Let's see, as key events may be involved with several AOPs just there. Uh, and can you can you also read the question? Because uh, I think it's just the organizer who can read who can see. This oh, OK. Question. OK, the second question is um, as key events may be involved with several AOP due to multiple MIEs, is there not a second AOP phase needed where data will be used to evaluate key event networks in order to predict toxicity? So basically um, a validation stage for the AOP, I think is the question. Um, and, and certainly that was um, a motivation for um, creating the AOP database so that we could pull in other relevant information and and essentially validate the AOP using other biological publicly available information, um, layering on you know pathway information or um, disease information, whatnot. So that was certainly motivation. I, I think I've answered that question. Um, and a third question just popped up. Um, what do you think about pharma collaboration? Um, we do have um, um, some pharmaceuticals listed in our in our um, chemical tables, and and certainly um, the way that we're thinking about um, environmental toxicants um, is analogous to to pharma. Um, so absolutely a good thing. Okay, there is one more. Will a chemical substance have only one AOP? Um, no, the current um, way that AOPs are, are sort of thought of is that they're chemical agnostic. So. Um, just as a pathway um, could be hit by multiple toxicants or pharmaceuticals, um, an AOP can be thought of in a similar way where um, it could have um, multiple molecular initiating events, multiple key events, and certainly multiple, um, multiple targets affecting those or multiple toxicants affecting those targets. Um, Let's see another question. Um, how are you guys working? How are you guys working with them? Did you give a, the database to them? With pharma. Oh, with pharma. Um, no, um, basically we have. I think it's pharma GKB is entered into our chemical table, um, and so we have some. You know, portion of our chemical table is pharmaceutical. Um, focused 
but that is as as much of an interaction as we've had directly if that answers your question excellent so uh i think uh let's uh start this the two polls that you you prepared and then meanwhile we can uh, we can uh, also receive other questions do you agree with that Oli? that sounds great okay excellent so I will launch the question so uh, everybody has a few uh, 60 seconds to to answer it. Here it is. Do you want to mention anything on this? Look a bit at uh, the results. Yeah, perhaps we can discuss that a little bit, but. Um... Yeah. It might be that it's just bridge to be is not so well known, but, but that would be something which hopefully um, will be changed by uh, looking the, or watching the other webinar, as well as going to the Open ResNet website where we have some, or where this tool is also integrated. Uh, Wiki pathway definitely will be also very interesting, or is is showing the importance also of this. Um, Marvin's uh, presentation, uh, where we could see how wiki pathways can be also easily accessed via our squ uh, Sparkle's queries, which I think will make the integration also very nice and useful. Good. That's my two cents, but Holly, if you want to comment further or anybody else, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. Um, yeah, we were very interested to to have access to Wiki Pathways and pull it into the database, or or you know have a, that connection be made. So that was pretty exciting. All right, let's go to the second one then. Meanwhile, uh, Holly, you have another question in the in the in the chat. Okay. So the question is, for tissue information you use human base, are there plans for other animal tissue information sources? Um, I would definitely be interested in knowing of the sources. Our focus has been to try um, to pull in information that um, is, you know, comprehensive data sets. So um, I would be hesitant if it was, you know, um, animal tissue information source that was, you know, of a specific species or, or something like this. Um, uh, we, you know, have archival information from ToxRefDB um, that's already included in OpenRiskNet, I think. Um, and, you know, information like that, we've talked, we've talked about and tried to integrate that information um, before, but um, I'm more a fan of a more comprehensive data set that would apply, um, you know, um, a kind of across the board, like many, many species or a whole genome or something. Um, so rather than um, it gets a little tricky with individual, very specific data sets in the utility of those is um, limited, I think. Great. So we have the uh, the results of the second uh, uh, poll question, which shows that uh, specific queries. So the, the answer like 50% were for specific queries, 64% for output options, and other 27%. Uh -huh. Yeah. Perhaps if you answered others, it would be good if you just pipe these in as questions. Um, then we can probably, could probably more know what these twenty-seven percent are. With, 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 um, additional yeah, that functionality. Be. Perhaps also for the last section, if you if you see anything else, what what you mentioned, or some people also said others. If you have also for the integration with other tools from the first question, just post that into into the questions, and then uh, we can can quickly discuss that or 
Holly and his team, her team, sorry, um, knows what to do. Thank you. I guess while we're waiting, I'll just say really briefly that um, it's been very nice working with Marvin Martins um, on this project, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, integrating the database with, with what he's working on. Um, and so it's been a, quite a pleasure to work with him so far. There is another question coming up. Uh, do you have any AOP ontology? Oh which is also a really interesting topic. Yes, that is an interesting topic. Um, to my knowledge, uh, the only AOP ontology um, that's being worked on is um, uh, Lyle Bragoon at the Army Corps of Engineers is working um, on an a integrating an AOP ontology um, in the AOP Explorer, but this is my only um, knowledge of, of an AOP ontology um, on its own, um, for the most part, um, it's uh, like the work with the with the AOP Wiki XML and and other work with ontology that I know of is using existing ontologies, um, pathway and genetic for the most part, molecular ontologies. Okay, uh, Marvin just informed me that he is here, <laughs> which is. Fun. Um, yeah, no ontologies. I, I think there is it's definitely a need to, to include that and also align that with, with other ontology work. And that there, um, Marvin and Dingon are definitely also very good contact points. Uh, for I think this is this is when, or what I know also from the JRC here in Europe, um, that this is a question which they are really. I'm fighting with at the moment because the starting of the AOP wiki was more or less this Wild West approach that everyone mm -hmm. can do whatever they want and, and now um, you have to get structured, better structure in there. Therefore, all this work which you are doing on the end and definitely also on our side is, is extremely important to really get that yeah. easier in. Um, Exactly, Rex is, is <laughs> answering this, exactly what I just said, uh, things would wear, is, is the, the person I also had in mind from the JRC who is working on the ontology, but I think that is in coordination also with, with what you were mentioning. Therefore, there's definitely a joint European, well, US-European effort going on there. Good. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's great to see so many questions. This this also shows how, how much interest is in there. Um, for the questionnaires or for these few questions we just sent, if you if you have um, requests or uh, or uh, suggestions of uh, what functionality is needed or with what uh, tools this should be all. Uh, combined with, um, please send it to either me or uh, Lucian, and we will forward that to Holly. Or if you have the, her email address already, then I'm sure you can also just send it to her. Um, okay, we still have more questions. For this statement. Um, okay, George is uh, answering. We are currently working strategy approach for applying existing ontologies for the risk assessment we are doing across the US EPA. This is a pilot project which has been used in the IRIS program as a case study. Um, that's definitely also very interesting information for me because we are doing a similar thing here with different projects on trying to align to harmonize existing ontologies. Um, Therefore, that definitely also something we would probably come back to you and hope to discuss that more. Yes, that would be great. Good. More questions or last chance? Otherwise, I would say thank you very much, Ollie, and your team again for this presentation.
I think it was very interesting. Um, I th or I hope that we can really get access to that or make this access to the uh, AOPDD uh, working um, to help you to to then get this out and, and um, yeah integrate that more in what we are doing. I think you saw that there is a high demand and um, many people are really, um, impressed. It's just the word I read here from Rex uh, and others who clearly showed interest in, in having a set access. I will definitely write you an email and ask you for the um, MySQL dump, um, but definitely also the, the, the approach to the interface or the API is very, very on that much appreciate it and as you know we are very happy to help you with that as well even if we cannot help you with the internal politics um, just, you know, <laughs> find out yourself but uh, technically we would we will do everything we can to support this effort um, well, thank you so much thank you all um, for listening for uh, having these questions. Thank you, Holly, again, and I hope to see many of you again, personally, or in the next webinar. Um, yeah, that's all from my side. Just say bye, and have a nice day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thanks so much to everyone.